Friday, December 20th, 2019, was the last day of school before Christmas break for 14-year-old Harley Dilly. The day before any holiday break is usually a really fun day at school, with the little ones doing crafts, having holiday parties, and the older students maybe watching movies in class and making plans with friends for their winter break. However, Harley wasn't feeling well that morning, and even though he asked his mom if he could stay home, she told him that he needed to go to school. Had she known that that would be the last time that she would ever see her son, she may have just told him that he could stay home. Harley got ready and put on his coat to prepare for the short walk to school in 18-degree weather. He was seen shortly after leaving his house, but Harley would never arrive at school that day, and he wouldn't come home that night either. It wasn't until nearly 40 hours later that his parents started to worry and decided to report him as missing. Now, this delayed response became a huge point of controversy in this case, and it led many people to point fingers and blame the family for Harley's disappearance. A massive search ensued when the community was finally notified, and it turns out that Harley Dilly was much closer to home than anyone could have imagined. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Buckle up because you are going to be with me for a while today. And let's dive right in. Okay, 10 to lifers, most of my loyal viewers who have been here for a minute or two already know that I absolutely love Magellan TV. I talk about them all the time. I'm obsessed. This week, I watched Fatal Shot, a docuseries about the most famous and infamous assassinations. It was really interesting because I feel like I already knew about the major ones like JFK, but there were so many twisted others that I had no idea about. Fatal Shot is a new release, and Magellan TV adds 15 to 20 hours of new content each week, so true crime fans will never run out of something to watch. There are also new docuseries like this one that are added weekly. Magellan TV is the best value of any premium documentary streaming service, in both price and quality. 4K is always included in your subscription, and get this, there are no ads ever. Magellan is also so amazing that they are giving you guys all a free month trial. All you have to do is go to the link in my description and then bam, you are hooked up. So go watch, hit that link in my description, and thank me later. Harley Dilly was born in Ohio on August 12th, 2005 to parents Marcus and Heather Dilly. Heather had a daughter named Ashlyn from a previous relationship, and she was already 12 years old by the time that Harley was born. When Harley was one year old, the family moved about 20 minutes north to a city in Ottawa County called Port Clinton. Port Clinton is located on the northern coast of Lake Erie and is a very popular tourist destination during the summer months. It's known for its beautiful shoreline, boating, beaches, island ferries, shopping, and fishing. There are different festivals and events that take place almost every single weekend in the summer, and in the winter, locals and visitors all enjoy the nearby ski and snowboarding resorts. Port Clinton is very busy in the summer, with the population doubling from the amount of full-time residents all year. In the winter, it was a pretty sleepy town, but for anyone who enjoys being outdoors, it sounds like an amazing place to grow up. However, Harley was more of an indoor kind of kid, not so much into the outdoors. Marcus worked as a sanitation worker for Republic Trash Services, and Heather had her own business where she designed and made leggings called Dilly's Designs. This enabled her to primarily work from home, which was helpful because Harley would end up needing a lot of her attention. At five years old, Harley was diagnosed with Asperger's which is a condition on the autism spectrum. Asperger's can affect a person's ability to effectively socialize and communicate, but they are generally able to do most things on their own. While this was true for Harley, he did have three best friends and a girlfriend who he was able to form very close relationships with. As with many children with Asperger's, Harley developed sensory processing disorder at a very young age as well. 
He was extremely particular about the types of foods that he ate due to their texture, and he would mostly stick to foods of the same color, such as specific frozen pizzas, a particular type of chicken patty, and his most favorite, hot fries. He didn't really like to play outside too much as a little boy because he had an aversion to the feeling of grass. Having an undiagnosed child anywhere on the autism spectrum can sometimes cause confusion and even aggravation for some family members who don't understand the reasoning behind some of the child's behaviors. Before a child is diagnosed, parents, siblings, teachers, or anyone involved may think that the child is just being difficult. So at 14 years old, having to babysit your two-year-old brother might be aggravating in itself, but also having a two-year-old brother with some behaviors that are hard to understand proved to be especially difficult for Ashlyn. Heather has described her daughter as troubled and said that when Harley was just two years old, Ashlyn beat him and even hit him with a belt on several occasions. As a result, Harley was given a PTSD diagnosis, and that was one of the first instances that caused people to wonder how this harm was going unnoticed or allowed to continue in the Dilly family home. Heather and Marcus had a very hard time with Ashlyn, who they have said got into a lot of trouble as a juvenile and even ran away on several occasions, even staying in tents in the woods. When Ashlyn was 21 years old, she got pregnant and gave birth to a little boy named Rory, who she quickly gave to her parents to take care of. They ended up adopting Rory, and Harley's nephew became his little brother. Soon after, Ashlyn would become pregnant again, but this time she gave her daughter to the paternal grandparents, who ended up adopting her as well. Now, as you can imagine, a child with sensory processing disorder may become distressed if there are parent-teenager screaming matches going on frequently, and Harley developed a tendency to recluse to activities that he could do alone in his room. Preferring to remain indoors led him to developing several hobbies, which became more like obsessions. He loved learning any and everything, about sports and was said to know every single stat, player, score, and fact about basketball, baseball, and football. He would much rather watch than play sports, even though his attire was primarily made of sportswear. He was said to absolutely hate the feeling of jeans and would always be in sweatpants and some type of sporting jersey. His other obsession was video games. One of Harley's favorite things to do was play on his Xbox Live, where he could play and talk smack to other players who were online. Harley was also said to have oppositional defiant disorder, which can cause irritable mood, argumentative and defiant behavior, aggression, and vindictiveness toward authority figures like parents and teachers. He was no stranger to in-school suspension and even out-of-school suspension for some of his behaviors that happened in class. And his parents, Marcus and Heather, really struggled with managing his behaviors at home as well. They had described disciplining him as being very difficult due to his resistance to authority. He had difficulty regulating his emotions and his anger at times, especially if he was kept from doing something that he wanted to do, or if his routine was disruptive. He was definitely a creature of habit and thrived on a specific and predictable routine. If he was asked to do something that went against his routine, or if one of his favorite things was taken away as punishment, it would often lead to a meltdown, a complete and total meltdown. Harley's parents even called the police on a few occasions to come to their house for a domestic disturbance when they were unable to de-escalate the situation themselves. Harley was said to shower up to four times a day because being dirty caused sensory issues for him. It seemed like as long as everything stayed in his routine and it stayed the same, and if he was able to play his video games, things would go smoothly. As adults, we realize that sometimes unexpected things happen, but for Harley, this was extremely hard to deal with. One of these unexpected times came when Heather got sick in February of 2019. It's not clear what exactly happened, but she ended up being placed in a coma for 25 days, suffering from blood clots and severe hemorrhaging. So it was pretty serious. When she came out of the coma, she suffered from memory issues going forward from that point on. During this time, Heather's parents came to help take care of Rory and Harley, and this was very hard for Harley to adjust to. He just wasn't used to other people being in their home for extended periods of time, moving things around, telling him what to do, 
and he suffered with a lot of behavior problems as a result of the disruption to his normal day-to-day. -day. Heather had said that when she was able to finally come home, she wasn't able to give Harley the attention that she normally did, but at 14 years old, she thought that he was independent enough to not need her so much. Harley would look for belonging and community in people who shared his similar interests. And like many of us, he turned to YouTube. But instead of just watching videos or interacting on live streams, he decided to start making his own. What's up, boys? It's your boy, Harley Dilly. I'm back at it like a crack addict. And today, oh boy, the depression is over. The channel is... It's a channel. Harley would make videos about sports, gaming, and would sometimes even do vlogs and do live streams to chat with his subscribers about certain topics. He was extremely proud when he finally hit 100 subscribers, and he made a goal to hit 1,000 in the year 2020. However, his goals were disrupted when he got into an argument with his parents at home and they ended up taking away his prized possession, his Xbox. He was still able to play games on his phone and his school laptop, but he wasn't able to go live on Xbox games anymore. He'd spend a lot of time at his friend's house who still had Xboxes, but it really just wasn't the same thing. Things got even worse when his school laptop charging port got damaged and Heather told him that she wasn't going to pay to have it fixed. When this happened, Harley made a video describing what occurred when he got home, and he gave some insight into the things going on at home. Hey guys, what's up? It is Harley Dilly. Probably one of my worst days of my life. So, basically, I, um, was at school and I was, a uh, science test. I finished it and my computer says, 1% battery left. So I get to the next class and I put it on charger as quick as possible, but, um, it didn't charge. None of the computers would take a charge. So, I took it back. And, uh, I had to fill out a complaint. And that's one of the most expensive parts of the computer. And my mom said she's not paying anything. That's when I got home. So, then, I want, my mom wanted me to go with my, with her to go get a friend. And I said, I don't want to. I have work to do, so I want to go home and stay. So, she said no. We argued for about a good five minutes. Um... And then she snapped. She said she was going to call police, and she said she already did. She said, who do you think that first call was to? And she said it was the police, but I knew it wasn't because she wouldn't do that because I know it wasn't because I went to my school, and I went to talk to my assistant principal because he's, like, the only person I can really trust in this. So, I went to talk to him, and, um, he told me that my mom never called the police. So she lied to me to get me scared, and she locked me out of the house. So right now, I'm outside. Yep, the house is locked. Um, it is 3.30. I haven't ate anything, and I still haven't even got to do, get my work done. My mom's gone. She won't answer the phone. Um. So right now I'm a little outside. I got nothing better to do. So what's the point? So I thought I would stream this because I'm not doing a video of this. I legit was scared. Because I thought I was about to have to go to DH for 30 days. Because that's if I get another complaint to the police. I'm going to DH for 30 days. I mean, I've already took a YouTube leave, but I'm trying to do stuff, guys. If you knew what was going on in my life. It's just been a horrible week. Many of Harley's videos were taken down on YouTube, but one channel re-uploaded a video where you can actually hear his parents arguing in the background, 
and Marcus screaming and cussing about Rory, who was just four years old at the time and who had apparently spilled something. On December 17th, Harley accidentally cracked the screen on his phone, which was one of Heather's old phones that she had let him have. He asked his mom Heather to get the screen fixed, but she said no, because according to her, he had a habit of breaking phones and she didn't want to keep shelling out the money to pay for them. When she told him that she wasn't going to get it fixed, he reportedly took the phone into his room and crushed it completely, thinking that if it was completely broken, she would have no choice but to get him a new one. However, Marcus and Heather decided not to reward this behavior and told him that if he wanted to get a new phone, he'd have to earn it. And that seems like a really fair response. But when you consider that Harley also had a hard time regulating his emotions and dealing with change, it was much more of a significant moment to him. After the phone incident, Heather posted this on Facebook. The post says, This is a sample of what happens when he has a meltdown. He also cusses, screams, bangs his head, punches himself, threatens me. He is like another person. That on top of things not going how they should, I'm done. Lost. Want to crawl in a hole and die. Wonder why God allowed me to live when so many others had to die it really makes you question yourself. I try to be someone to so many, make people happy, be helpful, and my own life isn't so grand. I would give my life for any one of you, but my life isn't worth much anymore. Yep, I'm having a pity party for myself, cause I can. Judge me or not, I am human, I have feelings too. Heather has said that when Harley would get upset with them, it wasn't unusual for him to go and spend the night at a friend's house and then come back, or just go walk around, be alone for a while, and return later. They wouldn't discourage him from going off to cool down because it made it easier for them to deal with, especially with a four-year-old in the home as well. However, the Dillies didn't have your typical neighbors, and their neighborhood wasn't necessarily the safest place for a kid to just be walking around alone at night. The building right next door to their home at 517 East 5th Street used to be a church, but was later converted to a sober living halfway house. Neighbors on the street said that there were some sketchy characters there sometimes living in that halfway house. With Harley now being without a cell phone, many parents might have been concerned with their child walking around alone outside. But Harley walked the short distance to school on his own every single day, also to his friend's house and around the block to relax, and it didn't seem to cause an issue. On the evening of Thursday, December 19th, Heather had said that she went over to a friend's house to show them some of the new leggings that she had made. After Harley got home from hanging out with some of his friends, Marcus was at home with the boys. At around 9.15, he asked Heather if she would stop and get him something to eat on the way home because he was still hungry after dinner. Heather stopped at Arby's at around 9.30 p.m. and then made her way back to their house. When she got home, she said she didn't talk to Harley, but she knew that he was in his room. She said that Harley often fell asleep with his glasses on and the TV on. So around 10.30 p.m., she went into his room to check on him and found that he was asleep. The next morning on Friday, December 20th, Heather said that Harley came into her dark room and told her that he didn't feel well and that he wanted to stay home from school. She said that she rolled over and saw that her alarm clock said that it was about 6.50 a.m. Harley apparently had a habit of asking to stay home sick and playing sick because he didn't want to go to school for one reason or another. Not uncommon for kids, especially kids at that age. So she once again believed that Harley was being bullied at school and that he had recently gotten in trouble for slapping another student. So the student's parents ended up actually pressing charges and the week after Christmas, Harley was supposed to go to court for that charge. However, this time she didn't believe him that he was sick and she made him go. And according to her, she said, get your ass to school. She said she heard the side door open a few moments later, like it always did when Harley left for school. So she laid in bed for about another 15 to 20 minutes before going to wake up Rory and getting him ready to go to the babysitter. Next, she dropped off Rory and then ran some errands before going back home to meet Marcus. After his early shift of driving the garbage truck, he was going to go with her to make some legging deliveries to some of her customers. While they were out, they ate at a Cracker Barrel, and then Heather didn't realize that she had a missed call from Harley's school, letting her know that he was marked as absent. Her voicemail box was full, so the school wasn't able to leave a message, and they didn't attempt to call anyone else about his absence. 
Marcus, Heather, and Rory arrived back at home around 3.30 p.m., and Harley wasn't home from school yet. They figured that he must have gone over to a friend's house after school, and they left again to go Christmas shopping, and also had dinner and drinks at a Texas roadhouse. They assumed that maybe Harley was spending the night at a friend's house. So the next day, Heather checked Harley's room, but he still wasn't home. Now this was a little strange because usually, even if Harley was going to stay with a friend on the weekend, he would still come home to shower periodically. He didn't have a cell phone, so she wasn't able to call him, and she and Marcus figured he must have still been really upset that they didn't get him a new one. They went on about their day and didn't think to call any of Harley's friends to check in or any of their parents to see if they had seen him. It wasn't until he missed his Saturday night curfew that they realized something might have been very wrong. At around 11.45 p.m., nearly 41 hours since they last saw Harley, Marcus decided to go to the police station and ask for help finding his son. Him leaving for a night wasn't unusual, especially if he was upset about something, but not returning home for his shower routines was very uncommon, and missing his curfew is something he'd never usually do. An officer and Marcus spent the next several hours going to all of Harley's friends' houses. Since it was after midnight, most of them were asleep, but their parents told them that Harley hadn't been over that day. During this time, Heather posted a Facebook status asking if anyone had seen their son. At 2.30 a.m. on Sunday, December 22nd, police issued a Be On The Lookout, a bolo, for Harley. At 10 a.m., Heather posted another Facebook status and asked that if anybody saw Harley to contact Marcus or the police. That morning, they were also notified that Harley had in fact not been to school at all on Friday and that the school had tried to call Heather but couldn't get through. Later that afternoon at 1.53 p.m., the Port Clinton police posted Harley's photo to ask for anyone with information regarding his whereabouts or had seen him, talk to him, to contact the department. Wanting to keep the public informed, the chief of police, Hickman, made a post that police, the fire department, and the Port Clinton schools began a search of the area, and that they believed at that point that there wasn't any foul play involved and that Harley was probably a runaway. Harley's family was becoming increasingly worried with each passing day because they knew that no matter what happened or how angry Harley got, he would always stick to his routines. So to be gone more than one day was so out of character. They knew that something must have been very, very wrong. Heather was brought into the station to speak with the police and provide them with more information about her son. They realized that finding Harley may not have been as standard as other runaway or missing children's cases. Autistic, he has Asperger's. He has um, oppositional defiant disorder, PTSD from his sister beating him with a belt when he was two. Um, Sensory processing disorder. Um, Anger issues. In fact, the school was going to be doing um, like an anger management and a mediation between him and the boy that one of the incidents was with. Um, And I asked, did they do anything? And they said they hadn't got to it yet. Um, Thursday, you said you met your granddaughter? Yes. Marcus was still hungry, so I said, well, where do you want me to go? He said, Arby's, so I was there. Then I went straight home. When I got home, Harley was home, but I didn't you know, go talk to him or anything. And then before I went to bed, I went to check because he likes to leave his TV on or his glasses. And I opened the door, nothing was on glasses off, he was asleep. What time do you think that was? (sighs) 10, 30, 11. This isn't him. He should have already had multiple baths. He eats certain colors. You know, he has sensory processing. He he loves his hot fries. He loves his pizzas. He And it's got to be bacon pepperoni. He loves his chicken patty, certain kind of chicken patty. I mean, this isn't his nature at all. Okay. And, you know, my parents were like, oh, just stay, stay positive, stay positive. But me as a mom, this is starting to get too real. Okay. This isn't him. I, he's a mama's boy. I mean, through and through, he's a mama's boy. He loves to give him hugs because from the last time the police were at our house when he attacked his dad, that's when we told the police, okay, 
take the Xbox box and let him think you're throwing it away. We never gave it back to him. So he's just about gaming. It, this boy still plays with wrestlers in the tub. You know, he, he's, he's very smart. I mean, we just went to the doctor on November 10th because of his behaviors. And even then she's like, Carly, you need to get everything in line. You know, she knows him. She's been seeing him for years. He, he's just, he's so routine. This is not like him. And his sister beat the shit out of him. So I don't, you know, he has PTSD from her. It, it's just, this isn't him. This, this. So he had your phone that he broke. My because, old phone. Because the screen on his was broke. Is what we're assuming. We okay. didn't know his was broke at all. Okay. Had I known it was broke, we have insurance. You know, but it's still fifty dollars. But his his uh, Chromebook's broke at school too. You know, and they wanted me to give a hundred dollars. I said no, 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 no. It it wasn't broke when he left. When we were at middle school, we had an agreement with the principal then. The detectives let Heather know that on Thursday night, when she was at her friend's house, there was footage of Harley running from his home around eight p.m. Eight minutes later, he could be seen running back home and going inside. Neither Heather nor Marcus were aware of where Harley might have gone, especially in only eight minutes. Since any of his friends' houses would have taken longer to get to, it just wasn't making sense. Even if he went to his favorite convenience store, it would have taken longer than eight minutes to run there, make a purchase, and run back. Plus, Harley didn't have any money, and there was none taken from the home. They have found video footage of Harley leaving the house around eight o'clock at night, that he would have been back by then and it was around the house that he left your house and went somewhere for roughly eight minutes and came right back. Are any of his friends that close that he could have gone to their house and come back? In eight minutes? Yes. They found it odd that he left quickly for a very short period of time, which was eight minutes, and then came running back to the house and went back in the house. The only person that's close, the closest friend is James Crow. He's on 7th Street. I don't, I don't know anybody else over by our house. I don't know where 7th Street is. Yeah. Like, could you make it to 7th um, Street in that amount of time? If you... <sighs> I don't know. I don't even have a map to know. Uh, I guess. Okay, here's my house, which okay. is 5th. Okay. Here's Fulton. The first street is 6th, next one is 7th. Hmm. Any like stores nearby that he would offer uh, them There's to the, out? he loves to go to the corner store, that drive through because they got his hot fries and his cheddar fries. Um, Could you make that in the eight minutes? Just because we're not from I would here, say we're... that's the closest, but. Would he have money to do that? Not from us. Not. Maybe money in the house hidden somewhere that he would know. You know, it's funny you said that because after all this happened, I checked and all the change is still in all the jars. Okay. okay. There's, but I didn't know about the credit card they found, the prepaid card in his room either, in his name. So, but are you serious? He left the house at eight like that? Mm -hmm. Why didn't Marcus say something? I don't think he knew. So we didn't know what would be in a close vicinity that he would run to quickly. I don't know. I really don't. I have no clue. So what was he doing running away from his house and then back again? Could he have been meeting someone? None of Harley's friends had any answers, and the police didn't release this piece of information to the public during their investigation. On December 23rd, Chief Hickman posted that the department had been following leads through the night, and they invited members of the community to aid in a search party that would begin at 10 a.m. that morning. The local news quickly picked up the story and wanted to help and help get the community involved and get Harley's face out there to as many people as possible. People started sending in tips about Harley's YouTube channel, and there were a few videos that caused detectives some concern with that. In one video, Harley was sitting in a bathtub with his shirt off, answering questions on a live stream to his followers. Now, maybe at first that doesn't seem too strange. I mean, I'm sure most of us have seen weirder things on YouTube. 
but for a 14-year-old, it might garner some attention from people with bad intentions. And Harley even gave out his address and phone number to his subscribers or anyone watching his videos for that matter. So detectives started to wonder if someone who had seen those videos perhaps abducted Harley, or if he decided to meet up with an online friend that he met through YouTube or Xbox. Maybe that could explain him running that night, but only eight minutes is a pretty short meetup. The police kept that in their back pocket as a possibility to explore while they pursued other leads. Heather and Marcus's families came to help look for Harley as well and support them, because as you can imagine, they were said to be completely distraught. That same day, Chief Hickman asked the community not to conduct any more searches unless specifically requested by the police. By the 24th, the Port Clinton police upgraded Harley's missing person alert to an endangered missing child advisory. It was looking like Harley may not be home for Christmas, which absolutely devastated the already very worried and confused Dilly family. On Christmas Day, the police released an image from surveillance video that they believed showed Harley somewhere between 6 and 7 a.m., somewhere between the Dilly home on East 5th Street and the Port Clinton High School. He looked to be wearing a hooded jacket, and it's unclear in the photo whether or not he's wearing a backpack. Later that day, a financial reward was funded by some local charity organizations to hopefully make anyone with information more willing to come forward. Chief Hickman called any officer who hadn't gone out of the state for the holidays to come in and help ramp up the search even further, since it was clear now that this wasn't a typical runaway case. On December 26th, members of local, state, and federal agencies were called in to assist in searching over 150 acres. Twelve canine teams, several drones, and two helicopters were used to look for him as well. They searched all day, with no result, until it was finally called off for the night around 5.30 p.m. Chief Hickman spoke to a local news station to help clarify some things for the public and explained that an Amber Alert wasn't issued for Harley because there were no signs of him being abducted, which is one of the main pieces for the very strict criteria needed for an Amber Alert. When Chief Hickman was asked about why Harley's parents didn't report him missing sooner, he said as a quote, in the past when they had a conflict in the residence, Harley would go away for the night, so the first night, it was not uncommon for Harley to not be there. After searching the Dilly home, the chief stated that there was no sign of a struggle or anything unusual. They also sent cadaver dogs in the home and around the neighborhood, but came up with nothing. On December 27th, the FBI and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children became involved in the search for Harley. Chief Hickman requested help from the community, help distributing flyers door to door, and there were plans to put up flyers around the United States as well. Detectives requested that everyone in Port Clinton keep an eye on their security cameras for any activity or possible sightings of Harley. The community began leaving their porch lights on for Harley in case he found his way back home to somebody's house. The chief also addressed Harley directly if by chance he was listening and told him that he could call at any time of day and he would personally pick him up. The Dilly family had not made any public statements besides a few emotional posts by Heather on Facebook. One of them said, I guess it's time I get on TV and talk. People say I'm a horrible mom for not speaking and not showing emotion as much as my parents, but they don't know I needed to be medicated because they were afraid what would happen to me and I don't want to die again. What if this next time I don't wake up and I can't see my son come home? People are so effing cruel. They don't know backstories. They just assume they know everything. They didn't see me digging in my skin under the bow to control my emotions. I was so afraid I would lose it and need medical attention. It was so overwhelming. It's all so overwhelming. I'm sick of being judged. I just want him home. I need him. I love him so much he's my little boy. I miss his hugs and him making me feel better. Even his stinky boy smell. I have tried to protect him from all of the pain in the world, but he is a teen and can't always be a mama's boy. I knew as he got older I would lose a little more of his attention, but what I would give just to get that little bit now. I can't bring myself to clean up things in his room. I didn't want to wash the dirty clothes from his room, and I refused to put the tree and any Christmas stuff away. He didn't have his Christmas with us. And now Roar is going around saying someone took my brother to other kids. I don't know how to face some people. I was always a proud and secure person. Now I just want to stay home and wait for Harley's return. 
I'm so afraid he will come home and no one will be here and that will never happen. He just needs to be found. I pray to God someone or whoever has him will see how loved he is and let him go safe and alive. I'm scared to death. I'm under so much scrutiny and eyes I can't even express myself without someone judging. You don't see what goes on behind closed doors. You don't see my husband go search when he can't sleep at 2 a.m. You don't see me falling asleep on the couch and jumping up because I'm afraid I miss something of importance. Or how my parents are here daily to make me food to make sure I eat because that's not on my mind. But I take medicine and I have to eat. Or how I'm constantly breaking into tears while doing the dishes, laundry, and taking care of Harley's little brother. I can't lose it or break down in front of him. He needs me to be strong for him. Harley, if you see this, please, please come home. Call someone. Let us know you are alive and safe. I leave my door open and stare outside, looking at the road, the alley, the cars go by. Are you in there? Can you see us? What if all of the online and TV isn't reaching you? You've been gone and no one has seen you. Where are you? Mama loves you. Every night I sit on the couch and try to stay awake for you. Just come home, please. On December 29th, Harley's grandfather spoke at a candlelight vigil and said that not knowing where he was was tearing up the whole family. I'd like to say something. Oh, Let's get you up there. Got it. Um, I'm Harley's grandfather. And I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out for our family. You don't know how it's tearing us up. This could happen to anybody's child. Like the Reverend said, social media has done nothing but root a generation of children. It's tearing everybody apart, separating families and ruining everybody's life. My grandson had issues and he wasn't a perfect boy, but he was a good boy and he loved his mother and he loved his family. And nobody's perfect here. And uh, again, all I can say is it could happen to anybody. Thank you so very much for coming out and supporting us at this time because I don't know what we'd do without all of you. A pastor at the vigil announced to the community that everyone should ignore gossip and rumors because many people started discussing potential theories about what could have happened. These theories included the Dilly family being involved somehow, and Heather posted on Facebook that she was sick of being judged by some people. Her video made some people feel like she was making the situation all about herself, and she was accused of not producing any real tears in the video. I, you all want to see what I look like when I'm not taking my meds to help. You want to know what it's like to have a son missing. It hurts. It makes you feel like you can't go on. But you have to go on. You don't understand. You seriously don't know what it feels like. Stop bashing my family. Harley, please come home. Please come home. Let him go. Please. I want him home. I'm tired of crying. I'm tired of being strong when I can't be. You guys are such monsters. I can't believe that you would be like this to a family that's not a other son. He is my son. I love him. And I want him home. Let him go if you have him. Let our family move on. Please. Harley, if you see this mom loves you so much. <laughs> I'm tired of holding on. I want you home. I can't do this. I don't want to die again. Please, Harley, I need you. I am so tired of you, rule. You people are so mean. You people are so cruel. Just think of him. I don't care what you think of me or my husband. Please, just please. Leave us alone if you're going to be mean. Just look for him, please. I beg of you to please look for him. He is my son. He is a child. He is innocent. You guys can judge us when he comes home, but until then, you let him be. You let him be. You just search. Please pray for us. I've never prayed so hard in my life. On 
On December 31st, the police department posted that they had no reason to believe that the Dilley family was involved and that they had fully cooperated throughout the entire investigation. New Year's came and went, and there was still no sign of Harley and barely any evidence at all that could lead to where he may have gone. Nobody knew anything. Detectives searched everywhere they could think of that Harley would be familiar with and would maybe go, even places that seemed impossible for him to have walked to alone. Heather and Marcus knew that even though they had their arguments, it wasn't in Harley's nature to stay gone like this if he had a choice. By January 2nd, the reward was raised to $9,325, and the Port Clinton police requested security camera footage from homes and local businesses from Thursday, December 19th through Saturday, December 21st. On January 3rd, Heather and Marcus made their first TV appearance with a local news station. The heartbroken mother waiting for her missing son to walk back into her arms. I have to get up every day and look in that room and he's not there. For the first time since her son's disappearance, the mother of Harley Dilly is speaking on camera. Today marks two weeks since the 14-year-old from Port Clinton went missing. News 5's Olivia Fecto talked to his mother, who says there are no words to describe what she and her family are going through. The reward for information leading to Harley Dilly's safe return is now up to nearly $10,000. His mother is pleading for him to come home safe. There's no words for any of this. I would never want anybody to go through this. I mean, somebody had to have seen something. Inside her home on East 5th Street in Port Clinton, Heather Dilly has spent the last 14 days hoping her son Harley will come home to her. She's learning through experience, investigations take time. You see everything on TV, you watch all these crime shows, and you think, oh, that's never going to happen, you know, and they solve it in an hour. It doesn't take an hour to find out everything. Port Clinton police say 14-year-old Harley was last seen Friday, December 20th, between 6 and 7 a.m. Heather, when was the last time you saw him? Was it that morning, Friday morning? I didn't see him. I talked to him. There's a difference. But that's all she can say. She's worried sharing more information could jeopardize an open investigation. Just waiting for him to come home. For now, she's pleading for her son's safe return. I love you, Harley. Please come home. Please, I just, we need you. I don't, I don't believe that you ran, but if you did, just please, this isn't you. She's asking her community to help look for her son and begging them to understand her pain. People are contacting me saying my son's dead. How do you think that makes me? Just pray for him and share and please keep your eyes open. Somebody knows something. I mean, geez, how, how can a kid just disappear? Many people criticized the way Heather spoke in her statement and didn't think that it was as heartfelt as a parent whose child was missing should have been. As we know, interviews and statements made by parents are usually highly scrutinized, especially when the case has a lot of missing pieces. Many people local to the area and in the true crime community felt like Heather didn't show true emotion and it caused much more social media backlash. She was also scrutinized for not helping physically search for Harley, and people accused her of using her health issues as an excuse for being lazy or just not caring enough to look. On January 4th, Harley's disappearance garnered national media attention when it was featured on the A&E show Live PD. The public's interest in the case was growing, and along with it, more speculation. After almost two weeks with no trace of Harley, his classmates returned to school on January 6th, one student short. Counselors were provided for students who were friends with Harley or who were having a hard time dealing with the realization that a peer could just vanish into thin air. On January 7th, a new photo was released to the public of Harley. In this one, he was wearing a maroon Old Navy puffer jacket, which police believe is the coat that he was wearing when he went missing. On January 8th, the reward for information was raised to over $18,000, and more foot searches were organized by off-duty law enforcement officers from several different departments who just wanted to help wherever they could. Just as it started to seem like the community was losing hope, on January 13th, the local news was notified that there was a large police presence outside of a home across the street from where the Dilly family lived. Following the police, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation showed up, and a large crowd formed on the street outside of this house. 
the house has been referred to as a vacant home, which technically it was vacant, but it wasn't anything like an abandoned house. It was actually a family's vacation summer home, and they had been doing renovations on it for a couple of years. No one had lived in it for at least three years for any extended period of time other than to do work on it. The crowd lit candles and prayed that Harley would hopefully be found alive inside that house, or at least evidence that he had been there and could lead to where he went. A large portion of the community is out here tonight just waiting and praying that they find more information on Harley. Just moments ago, some of the residents banded hands together and said a prayer for Harley. Once again, just hoping to hear good news tonight. The crowd became less hopeful when the county coroner's van showed up at the house. Since it was dark outside and the home was fully lit from the inside, the onlookers could easily see in the windows and spotted a maroon jacket hanging up on a door on the second floor. This all but confirmed to the community that Harley had been there, even before the police gave any statements about what was going on. Even stranger, someone could be seen wielding a hammer against something on the second floor as well. In a recent interview, Chief Hickman went into detail for the first time about what took place that night. He said earlier that day, the Bureau of Criminal Investigation showed up to assist in the case, and the state investigators requested to see Harley's neighborhood. He explained that it was the halfway house next door to the Dilly home that captured Harley leaving the house for eight minutes Thursday night, and was the last footage of Harley leaving the home, supposedly heading to school on Friday morning. Across the street from the halfway house building, one BCI agent inquired about the green two-story house. Chief Hickman told her that it was a vacant summer home and that other officers had checked the entrances for any previous signs of forced entry, any unlocked doors or broken windows, and they didn't find any way for somebody to have gotten in. Scent dogs had also searched in that area as well, and there was no reason to think that Harley or anyone could have gotten into that house. The agent suggested that they start back at square one, so they walked over and Chief Hickman physically checked the exterior of the house himself for the very first time. He said that once again, the house appeared to be completely double locked with deadbolts and padlocks, but he also noticed that the door facing the Dilly home had a lockbox where you might keep keys for realtors or contractors who were doing renovations. Chief Hickman's wife is a realtor, and he called her to see if she could check if there were any listings on the home being for sale. She told him that there weren't any listings, but she was able to find the name of the homeowners. So he called the homeowners who lived about an hour away in a city called Avon. He called to see if they wouldn't mind him going in and searching the house. The owners said that they didn't mind at all. They were an elderly couple, and they thought that they remembered leaving a key in the box. But after giving Chief Hickman the code to the box... The box was empty. They then remembered that they actually had both keys at home, and the chief sent a school resource officer who was helping with the investigation to go and retrieve the keys. The chief and CBI agents left to continue looking at other potential places so that they didn't waste any time just waiting around. When the SRO got back with the keys, Chief Hickman, two of his officers, and an FBI agent and a marshal arrived at the home and approached the door on the north side facing the Dilly residence. They swabbed the door handle and the lockbox with a stain extracting solution to collect any potential touch DNA. When they unlocked the door and entered the house, it resembled a very typical home undergoing renovations with a lot of undisturbed dust. There was a piece of wood paneling blocking the narrow staircase going to the second floor because the owners didn't want to heat the upstairs when they were working on the house and they had already turned off the water. So the investigators took the paneling down and made their way upstairs. Right when they got to the second floor, they noticed a maroon puffer coat on the floor next to a Cleveland Browns jersey. They didn't know what this meant because they didn't see Harley anywhere, and they didn't even see any indication that someone had been there other than the clothing. There was dust everywhere, but there were no footprints or disturbances that they could see. One of the officers picked up the coat and hung it on the door, and they went and took a photo after that. They snapped the picture and ran it across the street to ask Heather if it was Harley's coat. 
She knew immediately that it was her son's coat. Chief Hickman said that after they found this evidence, they decided to back out and wait for a search warrant to continue further. Now, I'm not sure why they needed to get a search warrant since the owners gave them permission to search the house, but I guess they felt like it was a best practice to get one for legalities and to make sure that any evidence that was collected could hold up in court should it make its way to a courtroom. So that's when the crowd of onlookers saw a detective inside the illuminated upstairs room next to that red jacket hanging on the door, and a photo was taken and almost immediately circulated on social media and news outlets. When the homeowners told their son about what was going on, he decided to make the drive to his family's vacation home, which has been in their family for generations. And I'm talking generations, guys, all the way back to the Civil War era. He later told media outlets that his grandfather was actually born in the home in 1890, so needless to say, the house is very, very special to that family. After a warrant was obtained, the Dilly family and the community waited in agony to get any more information about the evidence found in the house. When the CBI arrived, they began assisting in a very thorough and detailed investigation of the entire house. The remainder of the exterior was examined, and two crawl space accesses were located. One small window was located on the east side of the residence, but it had to be forced open to enter. The second crawl space access was located on the south side of the home. The metal graded screen was damaged, but the investigators wrote in their report that the screen was unable to be removed from the window. There were weeds and overgrown plants surrounding the windows, and investigators didn't notice any disturbances to the area that would indicate someone trying to enter from that screen. When they accessed the crawl space, they appeared to be undisturbed as well. A tall TV antenna tower, which extended past the height of the roof, was located on the northwest corner of the home. On the inside of the home, investigators found multiple items that were consistent with renovations, including tools, gloves, a long sleeve t shirt, a white v neck t shirt, paint, paintbrushes, coveralls, aprons, drywall materials, towels, and rags I mean, tons of stuff. The gloves and shirts were taken in as evidence, and the other items were photographed and documented. The residence was heated by an electric fireplace that didn't need to utilize the chimney. Swabs with stain extraction solution were used to again collect potential touch DNA from various areas within the home, such as all exterior and entry door handles, deadbolts, one kitchen cabinet, a bathroom door handle, and all interior bedroom door handles. The swabs were packaged and taken in as evidence. The attic was accessed by an agent using a pull-down ladder, and a thin layer of dust and dirt was observed on the floor undisturbed. Two windows were located in the attic, and they were also closed and secure. A forensic vacuum was used to collect any potential trace evidence from the surface of both living room couches. The second floor had three rooms, one spare bedroom, one storage room, and one bedroom with a propped-up mattress. Swabs and stain extraction solution were used to collect potential touch DNA from the bedroom door handles, the stairwell railings, and the closet door handles. When the CBI investigated the coat that another detective had moved and hung up on the door, they placed it onto a sterile piece of paper and examined a rust-colored substance on the exterior and interior of the coat. Two areas were tested and came back negative for blood. The Cleveland Browns jersey and a red and black zip-up sweatshirt were placed on sterile pieces of paper as well. They were examined, photographed, and taken in as evidence. About two feet away from the clothing on the floor was a metal object that appeared to be a vent plate cover. They discovered a hole in the wall six feet above the pile of clothing, and it appeared that the vent plate had originally been covering that hole. The hole would have been used for heat ventilation when there was once a wood stove installed in the home years ago. The pipe leading from the stove would have been vented out of the home and into the chimney. A second vent plate was located in the hallway of the second floor. This vent plate was approximately five feet away from where the clothing was located, and they were both gathered as evidence. An identical vent hole was located on the wall in the storage room, and below the second vent hole, a pair of glasses were located on the floor. The glasses appeared to resemble the ones worn by Harley, and those were also taken in as evidence. 
The detectives and investigators were all baffled about what could all of this evidence mean? What could it lead to? There was no smell inside the home, no signs that anyone had been inside the home, and it didn't make any sense for the clothing to have fallen through such small holes if they were dropped through the chimney. So they decided to put a camera in the holes to get a visual from inside the chimney. When they placed the camera inside, it was too dark to see anything. So one detective had to make the choice to reach his hand inside. When he did, he could feel what felt like a head of human hair. The exterior wall in the storage room with the vent hole appeared to have relatively fresh paint and drywall. The investigators removed the drywall, which is likely what spectators saw happening with the hammer. Under the drywall was the outside of a brick chimney. The bricks appeared to be consistent with the older age of the home. After gaining access into the chimney by dismantling the bricks, brick by brick, the body of Harley Dilly was located inside the chimney, which was only 9 inches by 13 inches in diameter. In the recent interview with Chief Hickman, he explained that when the wood stoves were removed from the upstairs years ago, whoever removed them placed brick to close off the chimney from the second floor. So the bricks created a false flooring where Harley's feet were, but it was actually only at the second floor, not the bottom where a fireplace would be. He was positioned with his head tilted toward the roof of the home and his feet toward the floor or the brick block off. He appeared to be almost standing, but his knees were both slightly bent. Both his arms were bent at the elbow and were both up near his head. His right arm was bent with his hand near his back, and his left arm was bent with his hand near his chest, so like this. He was wearing only a pair of boxer briefs. He was covered in dust and debris and was in a very advanced stage of decomposition. The odor of decomposition wasn't detectable until the brick was removed, which would have explained why the dogs didn't detect the scent and why no one could tell that there was a body somewhere inside of that house. Harley was removed from the chimney and placed in a body bag and transferred to the coroner's office. When they removed his body, a pair of dark sweatpants, a pair of black slip-on shoes, one blue flashlight, one white sock, and one black sock were located on the floor of the chimney. 827 right now just got word the state called off its search for a missing team from Port Clinton. Let's go to Meg Shaw. She's live there for us this morning with the latest. Meg. Just about 10 minutes ago, Terrence, the statewide endangered child advisory was canceled for 14 year old Harley Dilly in a very vague release. They just simply said that the child has been recovered. No other details were given surrounding uh, the discovery, but we are expected to learn more at a press conference that is scheduled for noon today. Of course, this comes just after police, BCI and the coroner's office spent hours searching of vacant house uh, carrying out several bags of evidence. We also saw a sledgehammer being carried inside the vacant home that they were searching. Now the house that they were searching was just steps away from where Harley and his parents live. So again, that update from Port Clinton Police, that is a press conference that is scheduled for noon today. We are going to bring that to you live on air and online. For now, live in Port Clinton, Meg Shaw, News 5. The investigators believed that Harley entered the house from the chimney opening on the roof after climbing up using the antenna tower as a ladder. They said that by the positioning of his body, it was consistent with him sliding or falling down the chimney. The chimney would have been an extremely tight squeeze, but they believe that he somehow took off his clothes and pushed them out of the vent openings in an attempt to create more space to breathe. The rust-colored dust on the clothing looked like the color of the brick in the chimney. They didn't find anything in the home that would lead them to believe that Harley ever entered the home or was inside the living space while investigators searched for him. Chief Hickman explained that he had to go break the news to Harley's family and said that he saw the emotion that the public failed to see. Did you have to tell his mother? Yes, myself and the victim's advocate from the FBI, uh, we made death notification it was either 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. I know you've probably had to do that multiple times before. Was this case any different? Uh, any death notification literally just is not pleasant. Um, 
it was tough because for 23 days I was in Harley and or in uh, Harley's life in both Heather and Marcus because I was there every day every day in the morning sometimes in the afternoon I kept them a you know apprised of everything that was going on that I could and uh, they needed that face-to-face -face contact You've built this relationship with them at this point. Do you remember what it was like when you told her? What was her reaction? It's what any reaction when you tell a mother that their child is no longer coming home. Um, they have closure, but it was, it was bad. The next morning, the Port Clinton Police Department held a press conference to notify the public about the heartbreaking discovery and unfortunate end to their investigation. It's not the outcome we wanted. The family has closure. With local, state, and federal officials standing behind him, Port Clinton Police Chief Robert Hickman confirmed that the body of 14-year-old Harley Dilly was found in a house on Fulton Street Monday evening. Harley's coat, glasses were discovered on the second floor of the house next to a brick chimney. We were then able to discover what we believe to be Harley, who was caught in the chimney. The chief said the teen's death appears to be accidental. It appears that Harley climbed an antenna tower to the roof and entered the chimney. The chief said the teen got trapped in the chimney. He added that Monday was the first day law enforcement searched inside the unoccupied house that is across the street from Harley's home. We noticed the house, everything was secured. We had no reason to believe anybody was in the house. Signs are still up at Harley's home. Family members have been searching for the 14-year-old boy since he went missing last month. Family members and many who searched for the teen are heartbroken by the news. We were out here in rain going through the woods looking for him. The chief says it's hard for him to imagine the heartache and grief Harley's family is going through. What would your state, state of mind be if you lost your 14-year-old? I can't put words into that. Can you? Everyone was extremely disturbed to know that Harley was so close, literally right across the street from his home that entire time, and that no one knew. The officers tried to put their mind at ease by telling them that Harley likely died the day that he entered the chimney, before anyone even knew that he was missing. But the medical examiner did have to note that there was no scientific way to know for sure when exactly he died. His death was ruled compressive asphyxiation, and he is thought to have died within a few hours. This would have been due to him being unable to take deep, full breaths in the extremely narrow chimney. Let's get to some new information in the death of Harley Dilly. The Lucas County coroner says the 14-year-old most likely died the day he disappeared. A report with the new details was released over the weekend. However, in this report, the coroner does add, quote, there is no accurate forensic way of determining an exact time of death in such circumstances. The coroner has already ruled Harley's cause of death as compressive asphyxia. He was found in the chimney of an unoccupied home near his own house several weeks after he disappeared. The death has been ruled an accident. Police later announced that the reward money raised for information leading to Harley would be used to cover his funeral expenses, and the rest would be donated to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Harley's funeral was held on Saturday, January 25, 2020. So that is the story as told by the police reports, detective interviews, and accounts from Chief Hickman. But it is very important to note that for many people, this case is far from closed. Now, I want to reiterate that from here on, I'm going to go over some theories that people have about this case and other information that was gathered after the fact that could possibly point to something else happening other than this being a tragic accident. I want to just make mention one more time. This is theories and speculation not confirmed by law enforcement, some believe it to be true, however, but please always do your own research. Several months after Harley was found, Heather made a statement on her Facebook, which again was highly criticized by the public, because it appears as though she was blaming Harley for what had happened. Her Facebook post read, Nine months ago today, I told my son to get your ass to school when he asked to stay home. It was the last day before winter break. It was a Friday, so no school the next day. It was a pep rally, so not really doing any work. 
I will forever regret those words. I will forever have that last image. Me too lazy to turn on a light, too lazy to get up. I was tired. Hell, I don't even know if the time I thought I saw was what I thought, being 6.50 a.m. I will forever feel that guilt. Then waking up not knowing my son wasn't at school. Trying to get my four-year-old up and moving. My husband stopping with garbage trucks to pick up a step two desk that had been sitting outside for days and no one had picked it up. Gathering all my items to deliver, bills to pay, trips to the bank. I had receipts to show everywhere I went and messages from texting people. Going about my rushed day, again, not knowing anything. Yes, we went to dinner. Again, to me, he was at a friend's house after school pulling his normal behaviors. Again, not knowing anything, but did you know I was also at Majors that night? I left Christmas cards on random cars and in Majors gave random Christmas cards to strangers to put a smile on their face because you never know if they have a family to have Christmas with because you don't know if it's going to mean the world that someone acknowledged them. I had texted Harley asking him, are you coming home? This was a normal thing for him to do, then call and say, oh, my phone died. Then in the morning, I just thought something was more important than us because, again, he does this. Oh, and he didn't like to go out to the country to be with family when he could stay home and watch YouTube, make movies, and play video games. Things not allowed there. Not like he could do himself. But when you drive, you don't answer. We picked up a pie. Yes, again, foods Harley wouldn't eat, so again, he hated to go to the places when he could stay home. Oh, and call us to go somewhere, if he was thoughtful enough to do so. Other times, he just snuck out. Normal teenage behavior. Maybe not your teen, but ours. I'm not going to beat myself up over what we could have done, should have done, or had done. He is gone. It was an accident. I never thought ever that he was gone. I think that's what hurts. I didn't have that feeling that something was wrong. I didn't feel like he needed me. Movies make it like, oh, you can feel your child is hurt, needs you. Yeah, not everyone gets that feeling. Apparently, because if I would have, I would have called the school. I would have made an attempt to find him. I'm here to share with you all so you don't have this happen. No, not that you are better or worse than me, just that if anything, my son's passing may have helped you all. Maybe you are more patient, maybe a better relationship. I mean, you have to take something from this tragedy, good or bad. I don't care what you all think about me. Living with the images people verbally place in your head, the conspiracies, the truths, the opinion, it all plays on my heart and in my mind. I could have been a perfect parent, but because of things said and written about me, I'm better off dead. I close my eyes and have to get the instant pop-up images of my son stuck in the chimney, his shoes. People saying my husband did it with a garbage truck, then setting fire to the garbage pile, etc. There are so many lies, rumors, and conspiracies. But see, while I tried to avoid so so I could focus on healing and grieving, people made sure to send me all of this through private messages. Or to my house, calls, texts, so many nasty and sorry stupid people who believe every little thing that was said. You know why I didn't reply? Because even if I said the earth was round, they would say it's square. Because it can't be that the parents had nothing to do with his death. Even as I write this out of anger, out of blowing up from it all built up and saved in my head, on my mind, weight holding me and stopped me from living, won't shop in stores, keeps head down, can't look people in their eyes, you made me feel guilty for being innocent. You made me a monster when I would give everything I had to help you. You have turned my life into more pain than just losing my son. You are killing me. You have chosen my gate and you have taken another life. Mine. I already lost a child. A pain I hope you never feel. I have lost a part of me. I have lost my future. I will no longer be able to see my son hit milestones like getting his license, graduating high school, college, getting married, get his heart broken, have all his little Harleys, need help buying a home, a car, pay his bills when he loses a job and his NFL contract closes, had to put a bit of humor in there. I have been robbed of all of those opportunities, and I see everyone else post. Even the dinner out with a son, family pictures because a family member is no longer with us. I now have to keep a box and tote full of my son's memories, his ashes on a shelf, I don't get hugs with arms surrounding me. I'm thankful for every windy moment that I can stand outside, close my eyes, and feel him hugging me. The warm sun on my face is his beautiful smile. So nine months ago, a part of me died and he called me mom. So don't judge me when you see me actually doing something, because behind those closed bathroom stalls, behind my steering wheel, in the closet, whenever I am alone and have a minute, trust me, I blame myself for enjoying a moment. 
for breathing. I know one day we will be together again and he will be waiting right there for me and I will get that hug and all of this will be over. Just remember, I still have a five-year-old and he needs me, my husband, my family, and friends. My story is not over and I'm ready to start the next chapter. I love you and miss you, Harley. A long-winded statement and one that I'm sorry was not written very well, so it has some breaks in there, but I was trying to read it as exact as she wrote it. Now, many people felt like the tone of her statement was more angry and accusatory, but others pointed out that the anger is still a real stage in the grieving process. And in my opinion, it did seem very heartfelt and like a grieving parent who is struggling, trying to see ups and downs and every side of everything, going from one motion fleeting to another so quickly. On several Facebook groups, Reddit pages, and YouTube channels, people have discussed the fact that Harley was supposedly able to remove all of his clothing besides his underwear in a 9 by 13 chimney, which was so tight that he couldn't even breathe. They wonder if the chimney was that tight how he was able to maneuver his arms and his legs enough to take off his clothing. Now, I can see him possibly throwing his jacket down first, but then once he went in, he would have had to have bend to get the jacket and then shove it through the hole. One creator made a video with her son, who is similar in size to Harley. While we can see that it is possible for him to move inside the space, it's not possible for him to be able to take his clothing off. These photos show the perspective of just how small a 9 by 13 is. Other people have posted this video to show that even a grown man can technically slip through an even smaller opening, but again, I don't think it would be possible for that man to take off two jackets, a shirt, pants, shoes, and socks while in such a small space. I guess anything is possible when you are fighting for your life, and based on the positioning of his arms, perhaps something was broken as he was trying to maneuver and wiggle. In the interview with Chief Hickman, he explained that sometimes children with autism have trouble with spatial awareness and that Harley may not have been able to estimate how small the opening of the chimney actually was. But that poses the question, if he put his legs and waist down in the top of the chimney, wouldn't he have noticed quickly that that wasn't going to work? Or did he just jump in like a pencil dive style, feet first expecting to fall two stories into the fireplace and crash like Santa Claus. And I'm not trying to be funny here, guys, at all, but honestly, I'm not alone in thinking that Harley wasn't that naive. There have been creators who drove by Harley's home and the house that he was found in and showed that there are constantly people around, and it would have been incredibly obvious if someone was just walking across that rooftop. There is also still the bizarre unanswered question about why Harley randomly bolted from his house at 8 p.m. on Thursday night and then back again eight minutes later. Was he possibly running over to that house to check and see if any doors or windows were open to go inside the next day? I know that Heather believes that he went to that house to get on the roof and wait for her to leave so that he could go home and play video games. But if that were the case, why would he even need to go inside? especially through such a risky entrance. Couldn't you just hide behind the back? Surely you don't need to hide out in a chimney. Another creator on YouTube called Truth For Reality has gone in-depth on the exterior windows of the home that lead into the cellar. He believes that Harley could have easily taken the screens off the windows and just placed them back on like they appear to be in the evidence photos, being held up with bricks and entered in through the cellar. He and other creators also think that it just doesn't make any sense for Harley to risk climbing up that antenna tower to climb on that extremely steep roof and try to fall two stories down into the fireplace. Chief Hickman pointed out a sad realization, that even if Harley did technically fit through the chimney, he wouldn't have been able to make it to the bottom anyway, because of that brick block off that was placed there, so he would have inevitably been stuck regardless of how wide or narrow it was which is really sad to think about. There was a petition going around online to try to get Harley's parents at least prosecuted for negligence, especially since they waited over 40 hours to report him as missing. Heather said herself several times that her son was always following his routine, and after one night of not being home to shower, wouldn't that have been enough to raise a red flag? Even if it wasn't too out of the norm, People have said that the fact that Harley didn't have a cell phone should have made Heather or Marcus call his friends or their parents to check on him and make sure that he got there okay, 
especially since he told Heather he wasn't feeling good that day and she had a missed call from the school. Even if your voicemail is full, you can still see that you have a missed call. Now, obviously, hindsight is 2020, but many people pose the question that if Heather had immediately called the school back or if they had reported him as missing the night he didn't come home, that he could have maybe been found alive, which, to be honest, I'm not sure. I mean, someone would have had to have heard him since he didn't have a cell phone, and that might not have been possible down the chimney surrounded by brick. But another piece of information that I personally found interesting when researching this case was in Heather's statement, she makes a reference to texting Harley, but his phone was broken. It didn't work. So what text was she referring to? And I just wanted to pull this up again as a quote because she says in her statement, in her Facebook post, I had texted Harley asking him, are you coming home? Again, this was a normal thing for him that he would do, and then he would just call and say, oh, my phone died. If you know his phone is broken because he smashed it, what phone are you texting? Or was that a slip-up? Did she not really text, and did she forget that detail? Something that about that just sticks out to me, and maybe I'm overanalyzing it. So, like, I don't want to come for an innocent person, obviously, but let me know if that makes any sense to you or if you can rationalize that. The police department was also criticized for not entering the home sooner as well. They got permission as soon as they asked the family. So why did it take four weeks for them to think to even search the house? There are conspiracy theories that the police department actually got an anonymous tip to check the house. But again, that's just a theory. So if there are people who don't believe Harley would have jumped down the chimney himself, then what else could have happened? There are some people that think that the fresh paint and drywall in the upstairs of the home indicates that he was possibly placed inside of there and then covered up. But then how was all of the dust undisturbed in the home? And what would the reason be for that? If the concealment happened right when Harley went missing, if he was killed in a brutal way and it, you know, or stashed there and placed there to die, could enough dust collect over the course of several weeks to then look undisturbed surely there would be a track that the previous dust had been disturbed i don't know i'm not a dust expert but what would the reason be we already heard that harley wasn't necessarily the easiest child to deal with and some think that marcus or heather may have snapped on him and then needed to stage a runaway slash accident situation heather has deleted most of her facebook posts but in the past she did make some pretty alarming posts that may indicate that she has some sort of mental illness and possible resentment toward her children this post says i will give you a number i got the number 14. i am supposed to reveal 14 things about me that most people don't know so here it goes number one i fight with demons mental every night I was R-A-P-E-D, and two other times attempted R-A-P-E, which I think she means someone attempted to do that to her, not that she attempted to do that. Number two, I frequently scream and cry for no reason, but suck it up and don't let others know. Number three, I am terrified that my daughter will follow in my footsteps, physically and mentally. Number four, I should never have had kids. With that being said, I love my kids, but not the way they should be, but the only way I know how. I can't love. I push away those that love me. That's pretty alarming. Number five, I love my husband, but because of my illness, I fight with myself about the choices I have made. Number six, not sure what happened to number six here because there was not really anything. Number seven, I love college more than being home. Number eight, I hate the fact that most of my friends live so far. I don't have a lot of true friends. Number nine, I am never full. I constantly eat. I've even tried to eat puke. It never worked. Number 10, when I write my papers for school, I have to walk away because I can't stay focused and too many thoughts interfere. Number 11, although I did not kick out my daughter, I believe in tough love and it's that reason that she is where she is today. I remain on her ass to make sure that she has a chance. Number 12, I had an abortion and I've had to live with that choice. So some of her posts are pretty disturbing, not only because of what they say, but in the oversharing aspect of it all. Now, in addition to those posts, people felt like Heather somehow made the interview about Harley all about herself. And then I found out he was going back to Daniel and James's house, or Daniel Jr.'s house. And I wasn't happy because I don't like Daniel Copel. Um, I've gone there a couple times. She's hit Harley, you know, and it's like, I think she 
listens to what he would say, oh, they're not giving me what I want, they're not feeding me, but that's because we're trying to get him to eat his foods. He needs to eat regular foods. He was just on a football team all summer. Now, you have to understand, I have a bad memory right now because I don't know if you've seen what happened to me. We're mm -hmm. from over by the Youngstown. Yeah. I don't know anything okay. about any of this, so please inform us. Um, February 18th, I think it is, I died eight times and was frozen and put in a coma for 25 days. I was in the hospital. So my parents came and they changed the routine and changed things and he didn't like that. He, he wasn't happy about that. But then my parents left. I have hypoxia, so sometimes I have a hard time remembering things, you know, and for him, he he was he even put a video, you know, I haven't been online because something bad happened, my mom got sick, you know, so he is definitely a mama's boy, and this is just so not him, and I just, I, I keep going over in my head, I can't think why he would run, seriously, I can't. There, there's no indication. He, he, he. If he was running, then why was he planning on going with us when he normally don't? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just the routines. I keep going back to the routines. It's not him. Even if he gets mad at me, or his dad, or his brother, or you know anything, school. He will sit there and he will literally just go away, calm down, and come back. He, he, it's just his nature, you know? Ever since what happened with me, I have not, I guess you could say, I have not been there as much as I could for him, as far as making sure, are you okay, kind of thing. But he'll come out, sit with me, cuddle, he'll grab the blanket, you know, he'll want to be with me. So I didn't think, I don't ignore him. I offered to take him to movies. Um, did it, my parents gave him the money for his birthday. Like the screen was broke or it just didn't work? What was he? The last we knew, he had a crack in the screen, okay? When this incident happened, and I don't even remember what happened, he, he got, he, he said I need a new phone or something came out. And then um, he showed me the phone and I'm like, what happened? What did you do? I'm not replacing, you know, I can't keep replacing phones. And um, he went back in his room and I heard smash, you know, cause he's got um, a metal futon. So I heard just like something connecting mm -hmm. and he come back out and he goes, it's broke. Two pieces. This is your phone. I'm like, what do you mean it's my phone? I didn't even know he took my extra phone. You know? And then I said, give me the phone. No, I'm not giving you the phone. I said, give me the phone. No, I'm not giving you the phone. I said, give me the fucking phone. He said, oh. and he took the SIM. I don't care about the SIM card. Just give me the phone. Set it right next to me, went to his room. I got up, got a bag, put the phone in it. Marked down the date, because if anything happens, um, from the incident November 10th, when he went to the doctor, we decided he needed to get back into counseling, but she feels it's oppositional to find disorder, and she wanted to find someone that can work with that. So he has an appointment with Velasco and Associates in January. It's all set up. So I was kind of like documenting everything because between what's, what's going on at school and everything. And even when I was in there with Mr. Vance, I said, I don't know what's going on. You know, this isn't him. It, he just, the last incident where he kicked somebody in, in the balls, he told us that it was a girl that said he had to do it or she would get someone else to do it to him. And that was like, why would you listen to a girl? Kind of, you know what I mean? Yeah. But he's been bullied his whole life and his sister beat the shit out of him. So I don't, you know, he has PTSD from her. It's just, this isn't him. This. So he had your phone that he broke? My old phone. Because the screen on his was broke. 
is what with. we're assuming. We okay. didn't know his was broke at all. Okay. Had I known it was broke, we have insurance, you know, but it's still fifty dollars. But his his uh, Chromebooks broke at school too, you know, and they wanted me to give a hundred dollars. I said no, 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 no. It it wasn't broke when he left. Is it possible that Heather could have lost her temper and done something to Harley? I just don't know how plausible it would be for someone to put him in the chimney and then re-brick and drywall it closed without disturbing the rest of the home, and it seems even less plausible for someone to have hauled his body up there and dropped him through the chimney opening. But I guess anything is possible if Harley climbing up there did truly go unnoticed. An interview with police and one of Marcus's co-workers makes it sound like even people close to the family that think there is more to this story. I do these roads in town. I see these cars. There is no way in hell that somebody abducted that kid on Fulton Street, not that time in the morning, because there's too much traffic. Even if it's dark out, there's still much. There's, you got the kids going to swim classes. You got the people going to Edgewood Manor to go to work. You got the people going to Magruder for the physical therapy. You've got the employees. You got everybody cruising up and down. Somebody would have got out of the car to pick that kid up. Somebody would have seen him. The small town. You got it. I know every car yeah. that I said because I explained the same thing. I said, I see the traffic coming down these roads. There is no way that somebody grabbed him. And I said, if that was him walking across that alley, I said, he's only got to go from here to Magruder Hospital and make it right. Mm -hmm. And from there, you only got two blocks. You got in front of the hospital, and then you got, the, then you got that. I said, somebody, somebody took your kid. And I says, it's somebody he knows. And that's how I feel. And he said, I come to... I, he says, well, I just, I've come to a conclusion he's not coming back. He, sa I, he says, I just don't believe he's going to come back. He said, I don't know what happened to him, but he's not coming back. Then we got on the conversation about money. And he said, I need to get back to work. But during that time, he just, I didn't see in his face that it was, it bothered me because I started feeling different. Because when I don't see emotion, Something's wrong. My kid's gone. I'm going to be sovereign. I'm going to cry. I'm going to weep because of my children. Every time you talk about it. Every time. And I didn't see that today. And when he said that, he just come to, he come to agreement that his son was not coming. You know, he's not coming back. Something's happened. You know. Like he made peace with it kind of thing? Yeah. Did he say, did he say those words? No. How did he, how, do you remember how he put it, Mike? He said, I've come to realize, I've come to, I come to reason that my son's not going to come back. Okay. Pretty much. So something to that effect. Right around, I mean, there was a word he used, and I can't remember what it was, but, and, and, then we started talking about money. What did he say about money, Mike? I'm curious. He said he had to get back to work. He could not afford to take off work. He said, but work had offered to pay him this week because he said, they, I said, he said, but I don't feel right about taking the money. He said, because I'm not there doing the job. And I told him, I said, listen, I said, you put a lot of work into this company. And I says, what they give back to you, you deserve it because you took it away. They took your family life away from you. I said, so take whatever they're going to give you. And I said, if you feel bad about it, come back to work, work a couple extra hours over, don't, you know, off the clock or something. I said, whatever you want to do. And he didn't really say anything about that. And he says, well, I got that insurance to work. And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, that insurance, you know, if something happens to your kids or something. He said that it would, and that's when I, my gut dropped. What's, do you remember what he said about that, Mike? Let's talk about it. No, that. because I cut it real short. Because as soon as he said, as soon as he said about the insurance, a light bulb flicked in my head. Get the fuck out of there. I didn't want to talk about it no more. Okay. Because I got real sick to my stomach. No man going to talk about money and a life insurance policy on the kid. 
That's the last thing I would worry about was that. He said that to you? No matter how broke I am, yes, he did. That's why that whole day I sat in that garbage truck analyzing everything that I've talked to him, everything that's happened. And I may be just, maybe it's something that it's not there. Maybe I'm grasping for straws like everybody else. But I had to bring him home. He got problems. I know he does. I've heard the stories. But the problems, that woman, she got issues. And I think she hurt him. What makes you say that, Mike? Because when I sat in there, I could see in her eyes there was no remorse that he was gone. There was no feelings. See, it was like a fake. It was like being at church, listening to a preacher preach about something fake. He wasn't who he is. You understand what I'm saying? I feel you. You know a good pastor, you know a fake pastor. And that's what she put me to believe. She was acting. You got it. I'm not stupid. Did she show any emotion? No Are emotions you? whatsoever. She had a little bit of tears coming down her face, but they were fake, you could tell. Somebody knows something in the house. And after Martha said that today, it really opened my eyes. I mean, I honestly believe they got more to tell than what's going on. Uh, Marcus, he's a friend of mine, but that whole thing about that life insurance, that is not, something's not right there. To be honest, with this case, I am leaning more toward an accident than anything purposefully nefarious taking place. It kind of seems like the Dilly household may have been a little dysfunctional to begin with, and Harley's parents might not have had all of the patience and skills needed to raise a neurodivergent child. Plus, after Heather's medical issues, it seems like she kind of stopped paying attention to him and being involved as she once was. Also, I don't think any of us are in a better position than another to judge someone's parenting choices, especially if we don't know everything that goes on inside their home. But I would say that if you have a kid who walks to school, spends a lot of time out of school, or is often home alone, then maybe just get them a simple flip phone. I know they were trying to teach Harley a lesson by not immediately getting him a new smartphone, but I think just for safety purposes, it's important to at least be able to contact your parents or 911. If he had his phone on him, could he have called 911 or his parents if he was struggling to breathe? Clearly, he would have been able to get it out of his pocket if he was able to maneuver and get out of his clothing. But again, I'm sure, again, hindsight's 2020. That's something that his parents probably kicked themselves for daily. I know that Heather probably beats herself up over that and even said in her interview that she wishes she would have gotten him a phone. Where's the library in conjunction to your home? Like, your house, hospital, Here's school. my house, straight up fifth, the courthouse, and the library. Okay. It's right across from the courthouse. Okay. Um, so decently close. Yeah, but not eight minutes. I, I just... That's driving me nuts because I don't know where he would go or why. Yeah. Can you say a direction? I mean, I think the same direction, like the way the school goes. You know what I mean? Like when he walks down that alley towards the school because that's where a camera caught him. Same way. No. Now you really got me because there's nothing over there. If Harley was to leave, like if he purposefully walked away and left, what would he take with him that if he didn't have, he'd be upset? A phone if he had it, which believe me, I pray to God I would have given him a fucking phone. Um, he don't have anything security, it's always his phone. How about just valuable though, something that if he was going to go somewhere, he wants that. When things like this happen, people seem to not be able to let it go until there is someone held really accountable and have a hard time letting it go as an accident or if they're not given a concrete reason why something happened. So with this, people have blamed the parents for negligence and even think that maybe Heather locked Harley out of the house like she did in one of his YouTube videos and that he was desperate to get inside because it was so cold. Being desperate and cold may explain why he was willing to take such a risk to get inside somewhere, especially when you consider that he had sensory processing disorder and hated being dirty. It just seems like an odd choice for him to have climbed inside a filthy chimney, unless he was truly desperate. 
Others have blamed the police for again not checking the house sooner and even the homeowner for not having a cap on their chimney and it being a safety hazard. I just think that for everyone involved, someone jumping down the chimney wasn't even in their wildest imaginations. After researching this case, I was curious about the likelihood of someone dying in a chimney, and this actually isn't the first time that something like this has happened. In 1977, a 14-year-old named Robert Thompson went missing in Los Angeles, and his body was found in a chimney, in a house just a few blocks from where he lived. However, it took 28 years before anyone found him. In 2001, a 27-year-old named Calvin Wilson from Mississippi was found in a chimney 15 years after he went missing. In 2008, an 18-year-old named Josh Maddox was found inside a chimney in a cabin a mile from his parents' home in Colorado Springs. He was found seven years after he went missing. So it does happen. The only difference is Harley was found much quicker. And if you had to think about it, had he not pushed all of his clothing through the vent holes, he may never have been found which is a really alarming thing to think about and realization to have. So what do you guys think about this case? There is still a lot of mixed opinions out there. While I am leaning toward an accident, the one thing I just can't get past is how he was able to maneuver enough to take his clothing off and push his clothing through those holes. I'd really like to see someone do an experiment or realistic animation fully enclosed in something of the same dimensions and see if it's really physically possible to do that. Regardless, if Harley did go in alive, thinking about him realizing that he was stuck, struggling to take his clothing off to create even another centimeter to breathe and screaming for help and accepting that no one was going to hear him is absolutely terrifying and heartbreaking. I can't imagine the panic and the fear and the claustrophobia that he must have gone through and then not being able to breathe while panicking. It's just horrible. To this day, the Dilly family still lives across the street from where Harley was found, which has to be just an awful reminder of what happened. I don't know how you could possibly live with that. The homeowners decided to allow the police and fire department to take down the chimney for respect and for safety. Since the home is so important to their family, they haven't decided what they will ultimately do with it because they don't want to just tear it down. However, they may never be able to finish renovating or stay there ever again knowing what happened to Harley inside of it. Harley would have graduated from high school this past May, and his school honored him by including him in the graduation program and setting aside a cap and gown for him. There were so many other theories that I didn't go over just because they don't really have much evidence or seem a little far-fetched, like the police department being corrupt or the body in the chimney being somebody else. Whatever the case may be, this is just a tragic situation and we more than likely will never know exactly how or why Harley ended up where he did. I know we were together for a long time today, guys, so I appreciate you sticking with me. If you want more true crime content like this, please don't forget, give this video a thumbs up quickly before you X out of it, and subscribe to this channel if you have not done so already. It is a free way to support the channel, and we'll make sure that anytime you open YouTube on your phone or your computer, you see any new videos and cases that I post and share with you. All right, guys, thanks again, and until the next one, stay safe. Bye.